My name is Monk Rowe. I'm very, very, very pleased to have Terry Gibbs back with me for our second interview 20 plus years after our first one. 20 years. 20 years. Yeah, have been good to you. You haven't changed a bit, Monk. Thank you. I'll send that check in the mail for you. Oh, no. You were ugly then. You're ugly now. <laughs> Same person. Okay. I'm talking to the same person. I love well, you. Well, you know what? We've picked we've picked up right where we left off. You know something wild? The last interview we did, all I know is we laughed a lot. I remember we that. We, we laughed did. a lot. You know so what? I was Go I ahead. was going to read I'm gonna read uh this is the Leonard Feather Encyclopedia of Jazz from nineteen sixty. And one Terry Gibbs, even back then had an entry in it and at the end it says Gibbs has always played with tremendous vitality and a natural beat that established him as the bop eras equivalent of Lionel Hampton well I don't know what what, what, what he mean by that well I, I don't know what he means by that uh, I guess maybe maybe the popularity or something because Bill Jackson and I were the only two vibe players on the scene uh, at the time who got well known as vibe players until Teddy Charles and Joe Rogan and a whole bunch of musicians, but we were the first two sort of. So there was Lionel Hampton and Red Norbo. So maybe, maybe I'm not sure what Leonard's going with that. I think I think that he wanted to make a distinction between the styles and the fact that you embraced bebop as a musical language and was a, and were able to play it on the vibes, I'm I'm assuming that's his point. I am a bebop player, and you know something. I, I, no matter what kind of music, whether you want to call it, I am a bebopper. That that's the kind of music I love. That's the kind of music I play. That's the kind of musicians I hire to play with me mm -hmm. when I when I was playing. You know. In, in fact, um, 20 plus years ago, you said about that period in your life um, when Dizzy and Charlie Parker were coming up with this new thing, you said, I almost had a nervous breakdown. It, th I stumbled on Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, and it was something so new to me I was looking for in my life because I had all this technique and I didn't know what to do with it. That's true. You know, but actually, my idols, you know, I never had idols. The people I really admired were Roy Eldridge and Leslie Young. <clears throat> and you know how they played? They played beautiful notes. They played pretty, but never a lot of notes. And I had all this technique, and I didn't know what to do with the technique. I mean, you know, you and especially those days you, uh, where Mill Jackson used to... Uh, when, when the motors came out where you can slow down the motor or adjust it to have what vibrato you want. Even that, did, I didn't like them. I liked it because I liked her slow motor. But, but the point is, I couldn't land on a note and maybe feel that emotion of a vibrato, like a trumpet playing, go, ah, uh, or ah. Uh. So hitting that note and holding it wasn't what I wanted to hear. So, so I had to get off of it. I had to get off like Dizzy, well, Dizzy and Bird, they can hold it over to because it's a saxophone. And and they liked, they liked the sound they got out of it. Uh, and so uh, they can hold it over with me. I, I only held it over there were times where it was the emotion I felt with the vibrato, you know? Okay. You know, one time, Monk, I, I was working on an invention where, where, you know, you have pedals where you hold, you press down to hold the note to say sustain the note. I had a double pedal to where you can press the other one at the same time and it, and it would adjust the motor. It would go, keep adjusting to where maybe you want to hear it. You know, you would learn just like a timpani player, uh, uh, learn, well, the, when the new timpanis came in, because I, I was an old timpani player. I used to have to do with the handle to, to, to get the note I wanted. Today, they just, with their foot, they press down and they get to the note they want, you know? Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted with the vibrato. I was going to get to where I could press down and it would get to the vibrato that I want to hear and I'd stop. 
you know, there'd be numbers so you'd know exactly, you'd learn uh, what number vibrato you, you know, there'd be different ones, uh, which I would, my brain had the idea, but not the brain how to put it together. Mm -hmm. I, I always had ideas, but never knew what to do with them. Okay. Well, speaking of ideas, uh, you, you wrote that when you first tried to play bebop early on, that your first note and your last note would be right. And everything <laughs> in the middle was very questionable. Well, you got to understand, when I first heard Bird and Tears, I was on my furlough. And when I heard, I didn't believe what I was hearing. And But I know they were playing double time. And I was in the Army, by the way. I was on furlough. And in the Army, I was the drummer with a 38-piece orchestra making all the Army movie pictures. We had other drummers in the band. So we used to have little jam sessions. And I would play vibes and the other drum play. And I played um, straight ahead, you know. But I came back from furlough and went to the jam with the guy, hearing Dizzy Gillespie. I, I, I got the syncopation from Dizzy because if you hear Dizzy play and took the notes away, you So I got the syncopation. The notes that Charlie Parker played, you had to be George Gershwin because everything he played was a song. Everything that came out of that horn, you slow it down, you could write a lyric to it. So my point, getting back to that first note, I, I heard all those notes, so I, I, I wanted to play them, but I didn't know what the heck they were doing. So I said, the first note I hit was always boom, and I end up on the same boom. In the middle was rock and spook a dog, uh, you know. I didn't know. Uh, the, 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 the rhythms were there, but not the notes, until I came out of the army and started jamming with uh, players who were learning like I was, and I would go down to hear Bird and Diz, and I was lucky that I learned the bebop language fast. You know, I, I picked up what Dizzy was with the rhythms, and I, and, and, and of course, of speak, court, change the chord change at the song. Everything was a little different. You, you know, those days, where, um, where when you play with big bands and you're a jazz player, you had to read music and play the thing. He had with this, you you had to have technique, really have technique. You had to be a, like a classically trained, whatever you were playing, because to play all those notes, you got to play your instruments that well, and then you had to know harmony and theory inside out to see how they were going through the chord changes. Mm -hmm. How they were even, you take one chord, like a, a, if anybody knows what a C7 is, they would take, they could, they could make four chords out of the C7. You could take four different chords and play on the C7. Where it would all fit, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be out. It would all be in notes, you know? Mm -hmm. I was watching you recently on a, a video that went back to, I think it was the Regis Philbin days, and it was a very up tempo thing, and you were you were wailing, and I was trying to imagine what is going through your head when you're playing eighths and sixteenths at an up tempo song, and the chords are moving quickly. Can you describe what's happening in your head? I, I'll tell you, the only way I can describe it is, you know how I'm talking to and I don't know what I'm going to say? That's how it is with playing. I've got the slightest idea what you're going to play, but it, it, that's coming out like I'm talking to you right now. I, I, I'm talking to you on a subject, I'm playing on chord changes and a song. I hear the song in my head. For example, I always tell everybody that have a, or young kids who want to play for me and tell me how, show me how good they are or want to study. Don't play the instrument, play the song. Like, for example, the chord changes to the song I Got Rhythm and the blues probably have more songs written on them than any other jazz piece in the world. If George Gershwin were alive and he could sue you for stealing chord changes, I would be in jail just like uh, Dizzy Gillespie would be in jail. I'd have a good roommate. I'd have a good cellmate. But my point is that I've written about 30, 40 songs. You know, there's, I'll, I'll, if anybody knows these songs, 
Yeah, I got rhythm chord changes. So when you're playing ow, you don't think of I got rhythm chord changes. You hear da 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 da. That's what I'm playing on. Not da 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 da. I'm not playing on I got rhythm. I'm playing on ow, even though it's the same chord changes. Okay. And and you know that was one of the secrets I found out about writing in the bebop era. They used to take all the great songs, and, like How High the Moon, and and on a, and, and Groove and High, and take the chord changes and write their own songs in them. Mm -hmm. Why should we give them the, all all the money? You know, you know those wild things. If you want to think back, going way back, that Coleman Hawkins record of Body and the Soul probably was one of the biggest records ever sold. He didn't get five cents in royalty for writing that. And James Moody, who wrote Moody's Move for Love, got sued for a while, but he won. Because he, they called him Moody's Move for Love, and he just used the chord changes. You can't sue anybody for taking the chord changes. I see. But you can't wow. sue them for stealing your melody, you know? Yes. Okay. It, um, I want to start out not going to get through your whole life, but there was a couple things near the beginning of the book that I um, really caught my attention. And one was your father's, uh, who hired sidemen, and you said some of them were schnorrers. <laughs> well, my father taught schnorrers how to be classic musicians. He taught common people, common musicians. You know, the, you're, you're talking about people who escaped from Russia like my father did. They all, and, and you know, any musician my father ever hired, it was like the Monday night Birdland jazz jam sessions where when you got there, you were hired, you never knew who you were gonna play with. You never knew who you were gonna play with. But no music, we all knew the same, we just play all this, knew the same songs. My father would have, he was a band leader, and say he booked two weddings for a Saturday night You'd have two different bands. My brother would be in charge one, and he'd be the other. The other. And the musicians that he hired, he hired them. Nobody knew who was going to show up at the job till they saw each other. And they all knew the music. I mean, they were they were the the best you could ever hear play what they call that scenic music. No books. I mean, these guys didn't know books. What books? You know, I hate to say when I hear young Jewish musicians playing with Jewish music, it's fake. To me, it's fake. Because it's almost like kids who go to school today come out and play jazz and they're playing somebody somebody else's chorus or whatever. It's, you know, they're, they're not being themselves. These musicians, uh, uh, it, it was ridiculous. I mean, how they were, when I was a young kid to play with them, uh, in fact, I was just telling somebody there was a clarinet player called uh, Naftula Brandwine. There's a record he made in 1929 with him just playing clarinet. It's about like, you know, they're all about like three minute songs. There's about like 20 songs on this whole, maybe four. I have the record here somewhere and I, I was going to send it to my friend because make a copy because it's, it, he is the, it was amazing. I, I worked with him. I wrote about him in my book when I was about 16. He was, he was an alcoholic and my father would use him on the job and he made sure that that, that he, he knew if he wanted to play with my father, he couldn't be drunk on the job. But when he was a leader and I played when he was 16 years old, you see what I wrote about, I can't, I can't say it on, on, on our show here, but you see what I wrote, what he said to me. Yeah. I he did let, see that. Oh, he let me so, know I was rushing, boy. But it was just he just didn't say you're rushing, you know. <laughs> so a schnorrer was um, yeah, so, so a common person. A, a common person. Yeah. It reminded me of uh, I, I spent a few years after, in, uh, after people you grew up with, yeah, yeah, and people who would take things from the plate and take yeah. them home, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Especially if there's, if there's a Jewish just called Kishka. And, and it was made, it really was made the best at these catering halls. They made it so good that you wanted to take, go around everybody's plate after the job was over, see if they left it over, you put it in your pockets, you know. <laughs> but my father taught them that, once again, if you want to be treated with class, 
you got to act like you have class. And I, that always remained with me, you know. Okay. I understand that Charlie Parker, um, in order to borrow money, would sometimes promise to show up on your gig. Is that correct? Yes. Well, he, he showed up to, not me. He, he did show up on my job. Uh, this is when I was just learning bebop, which unfortunately showed up and scared the hell out of me. If you notice that when I write my book, that, that you know, first of all, he would, as you walk down the birdland, he'd be standing there and he'd say, uh, give me a quarter, or give me a half an hour, whatever. That was a lot of money those days, you know. And, 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 and musicians would say, I don't have it. And they'd say, I'll, where are you playing tomorrow? I'll come sit in with you. they give them the money. And people would, where would we get out? Bird's going to come sit in. He'd never show up. He'd never know who you were. But there was, I had a great rapport with Bird. The first thing I did was tell him off. After he asked me for some money, I said, that you're the greatest musician in the world, begging and all that. I really let him know it. And then he said, where are you playing tomorrow? I said, over oh, Georgie, all Tin Pan Alley. And, and, and I gave him the dollar. I, 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 I did he wasn't going to show up. The place was packed when I got to work. I, we were the first 16 bars of Out of Nowhere, the song. And I'm playing in L.A. And all of a sudden, he, he walks in with his plastic horn around him. And he came and played the next 16 bars of Out of Nowhere. And he's standing next to me now. Now, once again, I, as I, I write my book, if you ask me, would I rather follow him playing and then start playing? Or fight Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson, one punch, I'm out. That's the end of it. Here I gotta stand here while he plays 30 choruses. And and and, and, if, and when I come in to play, I'll try to play everything he just played, you know. <clears throat> and so what I did, uh, I'll, because I mentioned the book, what I did on the 30th bar was always a 32 bar chorus. On the 30th bar, because I knew. I wanted to see if he was going into another chorus. I bent down to tie my shoe. I was on the floor. When he started to play more, I got up, <clears throat> stood there for 30 bars. When it came closer to 30 bar, I went down and tied my shoe. And then once again, then I loosened my vibes. I tied, I don't know what I was doing, but after about 16 courses on the floor, my piano player, who was didn't think he was even gonna follow him, because I would come in next. I panicked out and he looked at me on the floor like he's having a nervous break. He says, I know what you're doing. If you think I'm going to follow him, you're crazy. He, he was, we, we were also a bunch of scared little kids. You know, then Charlie Parker was so far ahead of everybody. You know, there's a record of Cherokee of him playing years ago in somebody's house, I think, with just guitar, playing in a slower tempo. You know, playing, sometimes playing fast tempo could be. A, a, a song with a lot of chord changes, like for example, Giant Steps. That was done very fast. And you you could get away by playing a chromatic scale on that song because every two beats is a different chord change. Every two beats. But Buddy DeFranco and I recorded it at, at a slower tempo. Hmm. And it was harder to play because oh. then you got to make sense of all the notes, you know? And Milk Jackson, I think that's the first time he ever said anything nice about me. He, he reviewed the record and said, now that's the tempo we should have been at. That he sounded good, you know. At that point, um, about that time with the Charlie Parker incident, were you in your early 20s? Oh, yeah. Very, I just got out of here. About, yeah. It could have been about 1940. Uh, actually, we, we left, I left Woody Herbs in 1940. I was about 24. Well, this is sort of a two-part question. I'm wondering if you had definite goals for a life in music, and did your mother support them? Did she think you were going in the right career? Well, just not all, I never had goals. I never had goals. I, I, I've been blessed you with being things fell on my lap. I never auditioned Benny Goodman, he called me. I never auditioned for Woody Herman, he called me. I never auditioned for for, for Steve Allen, Regis Silver, and he, they called me. So I've been blessed in that way. I, I never had goals, I, I wanted to play good. That was my goal, if anything, I just wanted to play to where I enjoyed it. I, 
I never, you know, it's, it's wild to say, but I never play for an audience. I play for me. So did your, um, your, your mother... Yeah, my, think... my, well, let me tell you. When I, I, I got thrown out of school for hitting a teacher, you read that, right? Okay, I hit a teacher. I got thrown, and unbeknownst to me, the band leader and the orchestra leader came to my house and told my folks that if I came back and apologized to the teacher, the principal, and the whole classroom, that I would, they were going to give me the, God. They would give me the uh, scholarship to Juilliard because I, as a snare drummer and timpanist, you know, in, in, in school, when you when you get into percussion section, you start out with the triangle because there's a timpanist who's not that good. He's a senior, and then you go, go graduate to the cymbals, and you graduate to, to maybe another instrument. Then the snare drum, that's like second highest. Then if you're that good, you get to be the timpanist. And so uh, uh, they would give me the scholarship to Julia. In those days, you couldn't get into Julia without a scholarship. It wasn't a school that became later on where it became that. It was a school that owned a guy like uh, Tony Scott. Uh, that's where I first heard him in, in, uh, uh, in, at Juilliard. And, but, but I didn't want to go back to school. And my folks... They knew where where I was going, sort of uh, musically, and so they didn't force me to go back. My my folks were really really understanding people in a way. Their 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 way of living was completely different than I. I was an American. They they were they had still had that that foreign thing in their system. They spoke Russian, Yiddish, and 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 they were learning. This. My father spoke fairly decent English. I, as I, I mentioned in my book, where my mother learned how to speak English from a, a black janitor next door. And, and she sounded, she got to sound too hip for the neighborhood because he, he was he was black. And he would say, hey, man, how's this? Well, who knows what he was saying? But my mother would talk to me. And I said, who am I speaking with? One of, one of the guys on 52nd Street. I didn't know what she was saying. But, but anyhow, they were understanding people and and they, of course, and by that time after I got out, I started. Uh, I I didn't want to go back, but then I went on the road with bands playing drums. So they saw that, and I was on my head with, since I was twelve years old. When I was twelve, I went on the road with Major Bowles. I was, you know, I was I was a very uh, I was a I was a very talented. I was a child prodigy, sort of really. Mm -hmm. And so uh, instrumentally, I had the xylophones down. It really, really had it down. I, I could play anything. Okay, Bef before we move on from this part of your life, um, sometimes you read that one of the reasons that bebop became a new style of jazz is that black musicians were trying to weed out the white imitators and that there was a racial component to this music. And I wondered what your observation was I back at that time. I don't that the slightest bit, because the feeling amongst the white and the black music that be out there was the greatest feeling amongst human beings. We all got along great. There was no problems at all. Uh, I, you know, I, I used to have, uh, I, was, I was really fortunate that the, because also visually, you, when you play vibes, it's like hearing a see a drummer. You, you, people don't know that they have to know you're good. Boy, they see you do that, wonderful, you know. So I, I got popular, even though I, I, I may have played good. I got popular uh, at an early age, I think, with the club owners made me a band leader. They, first they would give me a band, they let me have my own band. And I had a place on 57th Street and, and 10th Avenue in New York. It was like a, a biggest room. It was like a football field room with a little bedroom. And, and so, uh, you know, everything used to close at 4 o'clock in the morning in New York. It closed at 4 o'clock in the morning. But I had this place. I used to go buy all these cheap bottles of, 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 of liquor 
Uh, Bourbon this was going on like 80, 82 cents, and I have bottles in my house. And after the job was, let's go to Gibson's house. And, and I, it was, the place was packed in my house. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd find people sleeping on the floor. I didn't even know they were. They just, whoever showed up, it was, it was party time. Because I was, I was, I was blessed. I had, I was the band leader. I was making a decent salary. I had a nice place. I was living in Manhattan. And so with, I was having a lot of fun. And with black and white musicians, we, everybody was having a lot of fun. Was there a recording, one of your early recordings that you did that had, there was some issue you wrote about with, because it was a... Duke, a, Duke Jordan. Duke Jordan. <laughs> yeah. The, the, what was it? I think it was my, my first big record date with Alan Eager. Alan Eager, you know who Teddy Fats Reed was? Teddy Reed was was the first guy to ever record Bird and Diz for Savoy Records. He ran that company. And and Teddy weighed about 400 pounds. And Alan Eager was was the hot white tenor player. That, he was like the first guy to play like Prez that got, that got well known. But he had be, played bebop, but played by, by Prez. And he played with Bird and Diz and Miles and all those people. Well, Alan loved me and Alan had a great wild sense of humor so he loved my dumb sense of humor so he hired me to do this record date now i was leaving the next day to join the tommy dorsey band so i had my vibes at home all packed up and i had a straight vibe set and and i came in and this is never had any music you know what do you play uh he played a riff and other i made up two riffs and alan put his name on the songs and not till 30 years later when because Alan, unfortunately, those days was hooked on dope. Uh, but later on, when he got himself straightened out, I met him in Florida and he came to apologize for that. But anyhow, we were recording and, and, and uh, a, a new, you know, as I mentioned, the chord changes were different. Everything, it wasn't, I got rid of the kind of chord changes. Duke Jordan wrote Jordu, which the middle part or the release or whatever they want to call it had different kind of chord changes. And I didn't know them. I didn't know their song. So I, uh, Alan said, do you want to play George do? And I, I said, play the melody and I'll learn it. You know, I was very really fast. He played it and I played it right after him. And so, uh, but I didn't, uh, you know, and, and, and he always played short choruses, maybe uh, 16 bars, because records those days were three minutes. So, but I didn't know the release. So I, chord chase, I walked over to the Duke who was out in Raguni, though, Brent Mentley at the time, he was stoned out. And I said to him, I whispered in his ear, I said, Duke, what's the changes in the, in the middle of the release? He said, hey, why don't you listen? I said, I am listening, but I, I, I can't get it. He says, well, you got to listen. And he wouldn't tell me. So I, so I told Alan, Alan, I, I, I don't know the release. He said, oh, just don't worry about it. Just play the melody with me. Don't worry about it, you know. So anyhow, I was the new hot young kid on the block. So, as as we're playing, uh, and, and 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 we get to the last chorus, and I haven't played anything at all. Teddy Rigg stops the thing. And he says, "Hey, why isn't Terry playing?" And he starts walking out into the thing, and he can hardly get through the door. He was that big, you know, seriously. And and Alan called him, "Hey, you fat uh, f." Get back in the booth, I'm going home, because Alan was hurt. He, he said, Terry doesn't want to play on this song. That was the end of that. And so we went out with the date. But Duke wouldn't tell me the chord changes to the middle part that time. And so I made sure I learned those changes and played the heck out of it. Okay. Yeah. Did, did you um, enjoy being on the road, doing the bus routine, visiting city after city, night after night, You know, you know what, Monk? I that part of your life you never thought about because that was part of getting on the bandstand. That led up to getting dressed, showered, shaved, whatever. There were some times where we drove five hundred miles, and I did all the. I was, I was the leader. I was the band boy. I used to load up the instruments because I knew we had to place them in the, in, in, in the uh, truck we had. I had, a, I had two cars. I had a Cadillac, which in uh, those days you could buy for, for, for $4,000, $5,000. And, uh, and, uh, 
and I had a, what they call a sedan delivery. It was like a station wagon without a window, you know? And so then we loaded up. I, I was a bear boy. I did all the driving. I had another guy who would drive the other car. And sometimes we would drive 500 miles. After we, we, we played, Sundays you always played a matinee. Those days, believe it or not, you played five or six sets a night. So you play four or five in the afternoon from three to seven. And then from, from nine to, to two or three or four o'clock in the morning, you'd play in St. Louis and and, and then you'd I pack up the instruments and we'd get everything, everything ready, go to the hotel, check out, boom, everything in the car, drive 500 miles to Toronto, Canada, and maybe get there in time to check in. If not, just go right to the job, go change our clothes, because we all had, I, I had uniforms of the band, we all wore dark suits, and get on stage. And once we got on stage, Shine the Law came into our life. We were the happiest idiots you could ever be in your life. You know, it was the music that meant all anything. And to me, music always meant having fun, me having fun. I, the audience had fun because we were having fun. You know, it was very infectious. If, but when I got on stage, I always talk, because I little I love clubs. I hate concerts. I hate big play. The playing the Playboy Festival was the most money I ever made for a job. But the audience is twenty feet away. The closest person. There's no rapport with anybody. I, I get on stage first, and and I make sure the band we have fun. You can talk, you, can, you know, if you got something stupid, silly, I'll be the best straight man you ever had. But don't fool with the music. Just don't mm -hmm. fool with the music. And I would you know, talk if I saw a bald headed guy, I asked him, do you want a two play? I don't know what I'd say. Who knows what I'd say? I I, I became Don Rickles when I went on stage. Well, you, I, I'm going to turn to the, uh, the book of Gibbs okay. here because it reminded me of something that I circled. And you wrote, for most musicians, playing music is our crutch. If you have nothing else happening in your life, at least you know you can play music. If things are bad for whatever reason. Your wife left you. You're not making any money. You can't pay the mortgage. You can always pick up your horn and play. It gives you something that you can't buy. Because it takes your mind off of everything. It just, you, 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 you cannot play good jazz if you're not into the music. If I, while I'm playing, if I don't hear, the next note, you know, when, when you read a newspaper, how you read ahead sometimes, and it's always like reading it. That's what happens, like with music. You hear almost hear ahead, and so if I if 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 I'm thinking about my divorce or alimony or whatever, and, and I can't play, then you're not thinking. You know what I mean? So that takes away all the pain of everything going on in your life while you play. The moment you finish playing your chorus, you may start crying. But when you're playing your chorus, you're, you're as happy as a lark, you know. Yeah. You you seem to have sensed uh, over the years what kind of guidelines or maybe restrictions to put on the people you were leading. Um, in other words, you tolerated certain behaviors, but not others. Yeah, there were no you could you couldn't make you couldn't make any kind of hard joke my like bad. You could smoke pot, and and if and there's no smoking at all on stage. I'm talking about the big band, the dream band. Yes, the big band. But you can put your your cognac underneath the, the, the what do you call it again underneath the stand. I I allow that because what I would do is because I always I, I never drank off stage, never drank off stage. But on stage, I was the D Martin of the vibes. I would have a a, a, a cognac, I would drink cognac, and I will always say, ladies and gentlemen, Mel Lewis has a birthday. Let's all wish my, everybody in the band would go up here. By the end of the night, he was 125. I was wishing him a happy birthday every every fourth tune, you know? And so, we, but my whole thing was for us to have fun. And you know, it's while, just of course, talking about the dream band, uh, the guys, felt like it was their band too. So they never drank to a point where they couldn't play because it's almost unfortunately what's happening today with the COVID. If you don't get your shots, you're liable to give it to somebody else. You know, if if here, if you couldn't play, you'd be hanging up the guy sitting next to you playing his part. You know, mm. if you weren't playing, 
if it wasn't together, it could throw you off. Wow. And am I correct that when you were, the band was super popular, yet the scale was $15, and you were lucky to make 11 Well, after the scale was 19 but I gave the band boy $8. Then I made 11 And I was never happier in my whole life. It, you know, I, I, remember, I didn't start a band. It was a record date that started a band. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think have to, I'd have to explain the whole thing. I think I, I always tell people I'm not trying to sell books because the book has been out since 2004. And, and uh, I don't get much money. I never did get much money from the book. I never wrote a book to make money. I wrote it because the publisher asked me and Carrie Janelle, whose name I put on there, uh, was a jazz historian, said, called me and said, I'll, I'll work with you on it. And he says, you know, but when, when I say work on it, I wrote every word in that book. Carrie checked out every story, gave me some ideas. I was not going to write about my childhood, Monk. Mm. I was going to start out with the, with the Charlie Parker, Benny Goodman, Steve Allen, Frank Sinatra. I was going to start out. He said, no, you got to write about it. And after I wrote it, not realizing, I'll even ask you, I, as you read my book, I had a crazy aunt I went to the movies with one time that stood up and screamed in the movies. Somewhere uh, in your family, you have a crazy uncle or a cousin, don't you? <laughs> I think everybody in the world has one. So, uh, and you can relate to all, and all kids who played in the streets can relate to my stories, you know? So that, that, that and I was lucky to have a great child. I'm growing with Tiny Khan. <laughs> Tiny Khan was well from six years old Till I went in the army at 19 or 18, I, we were together. Until I thought with Woody Herman's band, really. We were together day and night. And if, if you can, people who read, know these names can imagine what we looked like. At 15 years old, we looked like Peter Laurie and Sidney Greenstreet walking down the street. Tiny was about six foot two or something, but he wasn't fat. He was big. And I was small, you know. And nobody wanted to hang out with Tiny. And I, but, but I knew that he was musically, talent-wise, he was, I, I can't use the word genius because he didn't live that long. But if you, if Johnny Mandel was alive or Al Cohen or Mandy Al, these great arrangers, they would tell you they learned arranging from what Tiny was doing. Mm. Mel Lewis will tell you he learned drum, the feel from Tiny Khan. Uh, Jeff Hamilton will tell you that Tiny Khan uh, Bill Lewis, how it all started. And by the way, you know why they played my band? Because I played that style of drums. Now, Monk, you've never, oh. ever heard me brag about my vibe playing. You never will. You know, I, after the time, I didn't like what I played after I, I recorded. But when I was a drummer, I was as good as any drummer playing today. Mm -hmm. Get this off, because there's probably nobody. It, do you ever get these crank phone calls saying unavailable? Oh, yes. They are bi-coastal. <laughs> they, they are my biggest fans. Yeah. <laughs> I get calls all the time. I mean, I can't sign autographs on the phone. Right. So um, you had mentioned that you rarely had to seek out new things to do, that the, the phone would ring like that except it would be someone with an offer to do something. And right. I, I admire that. And so I wanted to talk about your your TV band days. I, I'm, I'm imagining that that was a pressure situation. Like, okay, Terry, tomorrow we've got this certain guest and they want this theme and, and have it ready. Is that correct? Well, I'll tell you how it all started. I used to be, Steve Allen was my friend. I, I, I befriended Steve in the early 40s, late 40s. Then he'd be my friend, then he became a big fan of mine, you know, and, and when he got his TV show, he'd have me as a guest all the time. I was a guest a lot. And uh, it, it, they were doing a show in California, and I did a show uh, with them, and the, it, one of the producers, he loved me. He loved my dumb sense of humor, because I, I, I'm, I'm not a comedian, but I, I like a wit. So like Steve, Steve loved me because, uh, for example, if he did a comedy bit with uh, with John Lewis, 
and they wanted to use the band about four or five of the guys having a line or two. He'd give everybody a, 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 a script with a line. He wouldn't give me a script. He would tell me the premise and let me add limp my line because he loved my sense of humor. So anyhow, I, I, I went back to New York City. Jerry, my son Jerry was there born. And I get a call. I was living in New York from California from the producer saying that Steve Allen just had a fight with Westinghouse and quit. And they're bringing this young kid in called Regis Philbin, who was completely unknown. In fact, the first review we ever got said, what's a Regis Philbin? Nobody said, because the name was so odd, Regis Philbin. So he said, I'd like you to come in and see what kind of rapport that. I'd like you to be the musical director. I was never a musical director, but when I did TV shows, I always saw what the producer did. I was interested in and how, how it worked, how they put things out, what the, what, how, when he gives Steve two minutes to, you know, after he talked, how he timed things. So I came in and, and, and my audition was to sit with Regis and to talk with him and say, how because I'd be like a second banana. And I did what I'm doing with you. I put him on. He told me he was ugly. I, I don't know. I, I just was, I, I was doing Don Riddles. And I was just like, well, I, you know, I just can't help it. It comes. It just comes out of my mouth like the music comes out of my brain. And so they liked me, so they hired me. And the one was saying, I wouldn't go unless they gave me a 26-week contract because that's how usually uh, 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 the run of a show is usually 26 weeks. Those days, instead of 13, 26. And so uh, uh, unfortunately, the show got canceled after 20 weeks. And so I got paid for six weeks sitting home doing nothing. But, but I... I, I learned one thing. When I went into auditions, they said, okay, we want you, we want you. It's your job, but here. Steve Allen had nine-piece orchestra. We'll give you a nine-piece orchestra. I said, I don't want it. They said, well, what do you mean? I said, you either give me a big band because we're opposite Johnny Carson, we're opposite Elliot Lawrence, who was with Les Crane, those shows at that time. They all had a 16-piece band. You give me a 16-piece band, you give me a sextet. I said, sextet? Can you make it with a sextet? You see, working with Steve Allen, uh, of course, I didn't know we used to but what kind of talent he would have, but say you get Sarah Vaughan on the show or, or whatever. What's the most important thing? A rhythm section. A rhythm section. That's the whole thing. They they, they travel with, with rhythm section. So I hired the best rhythm section you can find. Colin Bailey was a monster drummer. Monty Budwick was a monster bass player, Mike Milroy, a monster piano player, and Herb Ellis. And I hired a guy who played all the reeds. And uh, when, when, when the singers would come in, if they had a big orchestra arrangement at rehearsal, uh, we would just play down and play the song, you know. And what I would do, I would take that arrangement. Everybody went to lunch. I would take that arrangement and use what, 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 like their introduction, but not to use their introduction. I write my own introduction for that song and I write my own ending. And in between, I said, okay, here, the flute will play behind Sarah, will play 16 bar, and her bells will play this, you know. And so long as we have, I learned something years ago. You give them an opening they can understand, and give them a closing they can understand. That's all people will remember, of which, of which I, which I'm going to go into some other completely and tell you a, a while so i using that thing. I was conducting a lot of telethons those days. And the old days, uh, the, the, it wasn't like a Jerry Lewis telethon where they rehearsed all week and they already had $80 million that all the corporations gave them. People were on stage collecting money, you know. <clears throat> and and uh, here in California, I had my own band, but we got, Steve Allen got called to do a, a telethon in New York. So I flew in with him. I took Frank Cap on drums, my drummer, and Paul Smith, who were doing my TV shows. Paul Smith is the monster of all t all television kind of plays. And, and, and I, caught my, I had my friend Al, Al Epstein get me a band in New York, a real great band. There's great musicians, you know. And so it, uh, uh, what kind of talent do you get in New York City? You get all the Broadway shows, and you never get the star. 
you always get one of the people in the show, and they never sing the main title of the song. They sing some obs- some obscure what I did, which I never heard before. And there's no rehearsal. They're just throwing the music at you. You get the music from Broadway show, you look at it, everything is marked up. You go from G to F, to A to B, go back to R, go home, have a class, or to come. You know, it's so ridiculous. It don't make sense. So I found a system. I said, well, here's what we're going to do. Play the introduction, everybody, because that, that's written, no problem. Play the introduction, Paul Smith, and, and I think it was Paul West, the bass player in New York, and Frank Camp. You guys will accompany the singer, and everybody come on a letter D, the ending. Play the introduction. Play. The singer never knew, we never played the middle. They never knew it. So well, that's what I learned. So I did that in my TV shows, and then, uh, you know, it was it, it just came naturally to me because... Well, the harder part got later on. See, all the talent we had for the first uh, maybe two, three weeks, and that's why Regis didn't last, were all talent that already were booked for Steve Allen. Mm -hmm. And Steve was a big jazz fan, so to be Sarah Bourne, Stan Getz, Oscar Peterson, Tom Macy. And Regis was never hip to that. You know, he didn't know these things. So uh, I'll never forget one time when we because I was like second banana, we had Count Basie on the band, on the show. And they're in the middle of the floor, and Regis is interviewing him, and Count Basie can yes and no you to death. You ask him a question, yes, no. And now after about three, four, five, yes and no, it was, Regis is going in the toilet. I said, Regis, <laughs> let me ask Basie a question. Yeah, come on down, Terry. Now we did. I did a two month tour with Basie. Plus, I worked opposite him a million times in Birdland. I said, "Hey, Basie, tell him the time of the story where Sarah Vaughan show or whatever it is." Now we had to tell the story, so we just loved me for that. Same thing happened with Snag Gets, who could yes and no you to death. So he had me interview most of the jazz. But after the, the two or three weeks of the jazz, then people like Eartha Kitt and people that we just had more in common with came on the show. And Eartha Kitt was wild. I'll tell you, that's a wild story. I'm not sure if I wrote about it. But Eartha used to come to Birdland when I used to work out with Basie and Sarah Vaughan. And, and I was always the baby. It was, I was, look, it was always Count Basie, Sarah Vaughan, Terry Gibbs. Two Kelly you died in Washington, Terry Gibbs. So she knew me as a, as a, as a kid at the club. Now here I'm, I'm, I'm a musical director. She came in with a, with a music for 84 piece orchestra with violins and everything. And she, says, no, I, she told Regis, I, I'm not going to sing. I said, I said, Eartha, do me a favor. Let me do something. Let me do something you know, when everybody goes out to lunch. Just sit and talk to Regis. And we'll, we'll get a chance to rehearse before the show. We'll get a chance. And I'll tell you what I'm doing. And so what I did, I had Herb Ellis, who was the greatest accompanist in the world, play Rubato, no tempo, because Eartha Kid could sling around, you know. In fact, I wrote a song called Eartha Nova for her when, I, when she used to come on the show a lot. It was the boss of was da 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 And she would walk in slinking like, you know, that stuff. And so uh, I, I, I I had that. And then I'd have, if we went in tempo, I did one year, we played in tempo with the rhythm section. And she could sing. And she loved me for that. She really loved me for that. So now I became a... Not a, a, a little kid anymore. I became the music director of the region. So, but I would do that with a lot of acts that would come in. I learned how to do that. It was fast with the big, oh, with the, with the dream run I had with Steve Allen, with the big band, of course, and with big, uh, when I had the little band, everything was jazz with Steve Allen, you know. Did, did you write um, songs sitting at the piano? Or did you? I, I, I'll tell you, I wrote both ways. Sometimes I sit down on the piano and I fool with different kind of chords, and I would sing something, and I'd write it down, you know, then I'd write that way. Other times, I'd be in my car, and, and I always carried paper, and, and, uh, and I'd sing something that I thought it was pretty nice. I'd pull over and I'd write down the first eight bars, take it over, and I'd put it on my piano bench. And I must have, I do that a lot of times. I met, but by, by the time I had to record next time, I had about 16 pieces of paper I put there. I take them out, and once in a while I play one. I say, what the hell is this piece of garbage I was thinking about? It's terrible. 
three, and then this song, and that's not bad. So then I would finish this song and write the next eight bars and write a release. So I, I did it both ways. I noticed um, that in the videos I've seen of you, you rarely have a music stand in front of the vibes. I memorize everything. Do you? Yeah. Wow. And so when you wrote out parts for, let's say, your six-piece band for, for Regis, were then, they then sort I, of... Then I, then I would have the parts. Yes. I'd have to have my part because I, you know, I just wrote it. I didn't even really know what I wrote. Right. I'll tell you my, my first show. I got to tell you this. I, you know, I'm coming from New York. I was still a jazz musician and I'm getting called to do a TV show. I don't want to give up playing jazz. So I, in my contract, I, I, I it had to be written that I would perform three times a week on, on camera with my sex tent. And so, because I'd be like an act playing, well, we don't read about that. And, and it got to be where I had so much to do that I didn't want to do that. So the first show, I, 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 Pick the tune that I recorded that I had all the music for that I wrote. So I had my music stand and we rehearsed. I had the music stand in front of me. Came showtime, all of a sudden for the band to play and, and the stage had all kept running all over that moving thing that ripped off my take my took my stand away. I got I had no music. What did I write? And, and luckily I, I remember but I, I missed one note because most important thing to me is the ensemble you play at the beginning at the end you know it's gonna be t and and it's a syndicated show so it's not shown for two weeks later and for two weeks i was having a nervous breakdown remembering god it's gonna come out of here that dumb note i played it was you know it, it went by i didn't even know where that note was but i saw the tv show it went by so fast i i, I swear I'm, i thought I was, i'm listening where was it not? I screwed up. I didn't even know where it was. You know, and I couldn't play it back. It was, it was up here. Would you describe your... Do you think of yourself as a bit of a control freak? No, not at all. I mean, you know, so while I listen to anybody in the band, for example, I wrote all these scenes when I did a show called Operation Tame I had the only thing following a singer, comedian, you know, I had all these things I wrote for the band. And, and while we were we we're, were the singer, and then I picked out what number uh, we're going to play, play them all. And my trumpet player, John Ardino, said, hey, Terry, why don't we play eight numbers instead of number four? I said, why? He said, because eight's in the same key as the, as the singer is. We want to, you know, we'll go right in the same key. It's great. I listen to everybody. If, if it's a good idea, why not use it? You know, I mean, I... I, I, I listen to everybody. That's how I learn. Excellent. Um, when I got to about the middle of your book and I turned the page and I saw the title of this chapter, Fago, I said, I know who he's going to talk about now. You know, everybody has many good stories. And not anybody living. I, one of my most fun time is I, I used to do a lot of the jazz cruises, you know. With 90 musicians would be on a cruise. And, and Mel Powell was on one of the cruises. And Mel Powell worked with Benny Goodman way before I did. And we sat there one night talking about Benny Goodman's stories. And who else? Well, maybe Ken McPlowski, he worked for Benny Goodman. Whoever was there that knew Benny Goodman, and it was, it was actually like a bunch of comedians sitting around telling stories. Because Benny Goodman did in real life what a comedian would write in a, in, a, in a skit, he would. That would be like you could you could write a whole skit on one of the incidents. For example, uh, uh, I think I wrote this in a book. I was standing on. He used to love when I told him jokes. I'm standing on 57th Street, and sometimes Benny could be staring in the eye, and and and, and you think he's listening to you, but he's in Pittsburgh. You know, his, his mind is somewhere else. And I'm telling him this joke, and I'm really into it. And I get to the point where the punchline, I got my hands up ready to get a punchline, and he turns around and walks away from me. And I'm standing like this, I'm 57 with my hands up in the air. I mean, you, you know, when, when, before I ever joined Benny Goodman, because I was always a Benny Goodman, I used to love the band, I loved Benny. And he's playing. 
I used to hear a story that so sounded so far fetched. It's like I tell you a, a story about somebody with, with a pair of black shoes, and you tell to this person, you tell to this person. By the time he gets in the seventh prison, comes back to me, it was a red shirt. You know, they sounded so far fetched. But after I work with him, I realized every story I ever heard about him had to be true. And I was full, so was fun because this man was in left field. He'd be, forget the buttons fly before we were on stage. Or comb his, <laughs> comb his hair. But he, when he kept played the clarinet, forget it. He knew and he called everybody pops. He loved my last name, original name, Gubenko. So he called me Gubenko. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you how. He couldn't remember people's names. One time, I think I wrote about it in the book, uh, They were gonna, he was going to do a tour with Louis Armstrong and the Benny Goodman Band. So Joe Glazer, who managed both of them, the agent, he told Joe Glazer, get me, this is in New York, get me Ziggy Elman. Ziggy Elman was in California. So they go to, I go to the first rehearsal, I went with Joe Glazer and Benny to rehearsal. Even though I wasn't going to be on the show, I just wanted to hear him. Man, you know. And I'm standing with Joe Glazer and, and, and Benny looks at me and says, I asked you to get me Ziggy Elman on trumpet. That Ziggy Hillman, I flew him in, and Joe Glazer could use every F word in the world, uh, you know, tell you, I, I, you F, I told him, well, that's, he says, that, that's not Ziggy Hillman. He what do you mean, that's Ziggy Hillman? Ziggy Hillman didn't know the difference between Chris Griffin and Harry James. He, he, everybody was pumps. He didn't know, he just, he didn't know your name. And I, I used to make jokes, it wouldn't have been wild. He once called his wife pops. He, 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 at a rehearsal up, in, uh, up where he lived, he, his wife came in and uh, was in another room. She said, uh, Benny, should I bring some guy some Cokes or something? She said, oh, not now, Pops. You know, uh, We always said, <laughs> we can imagine what it would be like when he was making love to her, what he called her. Can't make love to her. It's A.A. Pops. I, uh, you know. Ouch. Yeah, you know, it's what, well, he, he was foggy. He was left field. And the reason I, I titled the second uh, a second chapter El Fargo Rides Again because of the title of that song Benny Rides Again, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's suppose you sat on a panel of highly educated music scholars, and you, being the jazz representative, are asked the question: What is swing? I didn't say you're all a bunch of idiots. What, what kind of question? What what a swing? Anything that makes you tap your foot, I suppose, would be swing music. Uh, that's you know, uh, bebop was swing music. Make you tap your foot. Any any kind of music makes you tap your foot. That's only that's the only way I can uh, really put that name into any kind of sense. You know, mm -hmm. uh, tap it makes you make you tap then swing it. You know. Okay. Why is it that sometimes certain bassists and drummers don't necessarily swing as well as two other bassists and drummers? Well, because their time is different. You see, a lot of times, the drummer, you know, with a little band, a drummer could rush a little bit. You can play on top. Like, let me use Ray Brown, for example, playing bass. Ray likes to play on top. They give it that fire because it's a little band, you know? In a big band, you can't play on, on top because you got 16 musicians and the drummer, uh, uh, he's the most important guy in the band. The time, he can't go anywhere but sit, sit on, I call it sit on it. The tempo from beginning to the end, you gotta be as close to the same tempo because when you got 16 guys coming in, you're gonna, you're gonna play like four bars or something to bring them in it better be four bars where they all come in together. And so the bass player and, 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 and drummer, if they don't play together, there's not going to be a happy feeling to start with, you know. They've got to, the, the, the bass player almost has to play the same kind of time as the drummer, you know, in, in a big band. In a little band, they, 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 like I say, the tempo could go up a little bit because you all do. Everybody, as, if there's only four of you, you're all going up. Mm. With a big band, you know, everybody's not going up the same way because you don't think the same way, you know. Mm -hmm. 
if I put Terry Gibbs and Jack Sheldon and Chubby Jackson in a room together, I, I wonder what might occur. Well, you'd first you'd have to call the the insane asylum. You call the insane asylum, make a reservation at the insane asylum, because that that be I don't know, it'd be a lot of a lot of laughs. Yeah, <laughs> you're talking about. I, I, Chubby, Chubby and I had a, 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 a completely different thing that Jack and I did. I'll tell you about Jack. You know, Jack could get a little risque on stage. And, but when he worked with me, he knew that he could not do that. I'm selling music and I'll, I'll, let, I'll, I'll be a straight man. And Jack is funny without having to be dirty. You know, he's funny. He's got a great mind. So we had a thing on. We played at the Carnation Ball of Disneyland. And I hired Jack, and Jack had a good following, anyhow. And I always featured Jack at the end of the night, at the end of the set before I played my ballad and the closing tune. I featured Jack, and when I announced the name, half the audience it would come running over to the stage, you know, at the Carnation Ball and did and dancing because they wanted to see Jack because he was funny, and they expected to hear all these things. This is, this is Disneyland, you know, mom and pop, and. He say, "Oh, it's so great to be here at Disneyland," and then he would say, "And oh, it's nice to be here with Minnie, Mickey, and Minnie Mouse." And the moment he'd say Minnie Mouse, I go right into the music. That was we made that up because mm -hmm. people expected him from Minnie Mouse to go into one of his routines about some off the wall uh, out there with a female, you know. But that was Jack Sheldon. Yeah, Joe Maney was the guy you never had that my too. You heard when I wrote about him, about Joe Maney, uh, when he said, a, 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 you know, a, when it was the birthday when we, when the Dream Band played Happy Birthday to him. If you heard about the Dream Band. Yes. Yeah. yeah you, never so, hand, you never hand him a mic because he's working. Okay. <laughs> well, he was street people. Yes. So we've been at this for about an hour and I've really enjoyed this. And I want to wrap up with a couple questions. Um, I wonder if you could have done anything else in your life besides being a musician. You know, I did want to be a boxer at one time, but it was uh, it was either that. But play, I realized playing music was more important to me. I don't think there's anything I actually want to do that. I, I you know, some while I, I may have had a lot of mishaps, but we all I'm 97 years old now. We all have had some some. Uh, uh, rainy days, you know, and but I am a blessed human being that out of my 97 years, maybe two years of it, maybe I, I would say were dumb. It just it's something I, it's not I regret, something I couldn't do anything about. It was, it was a part where I wanted to get custody of my children from somebody who was not fit to have children. I, gotta, I want to finish because it's important. Uh, uh, that, uh, so that maybe in, in ninety-seven years, no nobody could be as blessed as I was. If if you look, if look at the pictures in, in the book, all, all those people. First of all, Benny Goodman was the king of swing. When I was twenty-five years old and he was forty-two, I played with Benny. After four bars, we were the same age. Music does no numbers. Same age. Now, I I didn't get. I don't think I wrote about this. Not only did I play with Charlie Parker, but he worked for me one time for about four weeks. I, 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 ben, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, who was my friend who heard me play because I worked opposite a lot of times. I was sitting in my music store, I had a music store when I was working Operation Entertainment. I used to go on the road for nine days and I would be in office writing music. I was sitting in my, I used to hang out in my music store. Dizzy called me and said, uh, Terry and James Moody had a bell palsy stroke. This is in California. Can you come play with me for 10 days? God, I mean, he could have called Teddy Henry, he could have called 50. It was, this was like heaven when they called, you know, play with people I, that I, that I idolize as musicians, you know, who were, who were the best. Uh, but Powell, and, and that's one of the reasons I gave up playing also, that I couldn't have a steady band. All the guys who played for me in California, they were great, Tom Lanier, He's on any Academy Award show. He wrote for uh, uh, for Dancing with the Stars. He wrote, you know, he, 
these guys are all busy doing what they call studio work. So they'll play with me in town, but I can't travel with them. And playing one night a week, uh, that, that doesn't do it for me. Well, you answered uh, my next question. Okay. And I was, I was going to ask you. I got this crystal ball. I got this yeah, crystal I, ball. I knew that indeed. when you... What was the question? The question was, does does Terry Gibbs uh, think that there were good old days in his life? And it, it seems like, almost without exception, they were all... All great, really. Good there days. was always something every year that was really great that stuck out, you know. Yeah. And let me tell you, let's face it. When you get a chance growing up and listening to Betty Good and, 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 and Duke Kelly and, 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 and get to know these people... Get to know these people. You know, I I did a thing with the Dream Man one time where Duke Ellington introduced the band, and I didn't want to follow it because that introduction was so great that whatever I played would be ridiculous. I mean, Duke Ellington was so elegant with his with his speaking. God, I I I said I was gonna I was gonna say, listen, what do I? I'm the greatest. He just he just said that. You know. He, so, <laughs> So uh, my point, I was I was blessed to have known these people, know them personally. You know, I Dizzy Gillespie and I hung out. Uh, I, I I did that tour that that, that I did with. I've got to tell you that one show. I probably wrote about that. Yeah, the Birdland All Stars of 1955 or whatever seven. Billy Eckstein, the headliner, when he was uh, with Jim, uh, with Bobby Tucker playing piano. Uh, and Sarah Vaughan and Roy Haynes and, and, and Jimmy Jones on piano. The Cal Basie man, when he had Joe Williams, Frank Forster, Frank West, Frank Jones, all the Sonny Payne, Lester Young, Zoot Sims, um, Chet Baker's group, Jerry Southern, Phineas Newman, Bud Powell, for two months. Could you do better than that if you want to play with people? Who's left? <laughs> <laughs> You've already been to heaven, Terry. I, I was. I'm still. I, I still am. I'm. I'm still talking to you. I'm not sure what I'm saying, but I'm talking to you. Well, I've really enjoyed this, and I want to. Uh, I want to close with the last thing you wrote in your book, and it said, "Even though we know that in to each life a little rain must fall, all in all, I've been very fortunate, for I've been able to laugh all the way to the bandstand." Yeah, well, it's, it's true. It really is true, Monk. I, I've been fortunate because I look forward to getting on stage. I'm at my most comfortable when I'm on stage because I don't, I don't work. I have fun. I mean, I, 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 I include my audience. I, that's why I don't like playing big concerts. If I, if, uh, when I play from here, when I play people, we play in a ballroom. At least the audience is close. They're about two feet away from me, so I can tell the guy to get a toupee or whatever. I'm going to tell the guy, you know, lady, get get a, get your nose fixed or whatever it is. I become Don Rickles all of a sudden. But you know what? We become friends, and they think they're at a party. Yeah. And so of my band is always party. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when we get together, it's a party because I like to laugh. And I, like I said, I'll play straight for Jack Shelton. Frank Rossellino, Connie Canoli, whoever has met Flory, who these are funny minds. They got if they want to say something, I'll say what what is it, and I'll feed them line. And, and you know it's wild. I mean, a lot of time, Frank Rossellino, I got to hear with the Dream Band. Frank, everybody loved Frank Rossellino on the band. He was one of the funniest people. And I have a habit of going. Oh, here it is. I hear it. I always give him the tempo. I mean, it was about two three minutes. And, and the audience who got, who got to heard the band a million times, they'd be yelling, here it is, everybody else. And I'd say, one, two. When I said, well, hey, Frank. And I'd ask, ask him any question. How's your mother? How's your foot? How's your car? And he'd get up. Frank would jump up and start. I don't know. He would start saying the most ridiculous thing. And Frank could yodel, by the way. He really could yodel. And he'd wind up yodeling, which had nothing to do with anything. The audience was in stitches. We already won, won the show. Well, the, we could play. The, we could have played uh, uh, the Star Spangled Banner. And they would have stood up and cheered, you know. <laughs> well, you figured out how to make it all work, and um, I really admire it. 
and you've made some I'm glad wonderful. You, I'm glad you liked the book. I'm glad you liked the book. Yes, indeed. So thank you again. This has been beyond my expectations once again. Mom, and, call me in 20 years from now. I will do it again. All right. <laughs> I may not be as fast witted, but something stupid will come out of my brain if I'm talking to you. No doubt. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the compliment, Mom. Okay, I'm going to sign off, and then we'll then we'll say our official goodbyes. All right, thank you, Mom. Okay. <laughs>